begin our sojourn for this 4th of July, 2023, America's declared Independence Day with today's relevance of Frederick Douglass's 1852 speech, What to a Slave is the 4th of July? Featuring historian Dr. Gerald Horn with a reading by the actor James Earl Jones of one of the most searing passages of Douglass's 1852 speech. Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom, of natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express about gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence Bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems or in human mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty, an unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass, fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes that would it they would disgrace a nation of savages. There's not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear, I would today pour forth a stream, a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened the conscience of the nation must be aroused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And the crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. <laughs> 
legendary abolitionist Frederick Douglass said this to an audience gathered to commemorate the signing of the Declaration of Independence. When he delivered his famous speech on July 5th, 1852, millions of Black Americans were in bondage. His words came a full decade before the Emancipation Proclamation granted Black people a liberty so conditional that critical remnants of the cruel and dehumanizing institution are still glaringly apparent in present-day America. After listening to James Earl Jones' reading a passage from Frederick Douglass' 1852 speech, What to a Slave is the Fourth of July, we're joined by Dr. Gerald Horn, one of the most gifted and insightful historians of his generation, to put that question to him then and for now as well. Thank you for inviting me. It's long been obvious that we are desperately in need of a revised interpretation of July 4th, 1776, and the formation of the United States of America, an interpretation that would be more in accord with the facts on the ground. For example, let's start with the recent undermining of affirmative action by the U.S. Supreme Court, the recent undermining of LBGT plus rights by the U.S. Supreme Court, the undermining of students' rights and the loan forgiveness that had been mandated by the White House by, once again, the U.S. Supreme Court. This idea of revising a historical interpretation is not new. Recall that it was W.E.B. Du Bois, the great Pan-Africanist and founder of NAACP, who in the 1930s revised the traditional interpretation of Reconstruction, the period following the U.S. Civil War, which to that point had been interpreted by mainstream histories as an era of Negro misrule, an era of corruption. And Du Bois portrayed Reconstruction quite differently as an era of democratic promise that was ultimately sold out. And that interpretation is now the reigning interpretation. As we speak, historical reinterpretations are in motion. The late editor of Ebony Magazine, Lerone Bennett, wrote a book, Forced into Glory, where he revised the saint-like interpretation of Abraham Lincoln, uh, underscoring his repeated efforts to deport the U.S. Black population, sending us all abroad, which um, barely failed in the U.S. Congress. You have a number of books that have in the title the phrase settler colonialism. That phrase, which is obviously appropriate to describe what's unfolded in North America in recent centuries, that phrase settler colonialism is generally absent from the vocabularies of even our foremost radicals. And yet we see mainstream historians and left historians as well seeking to reinterpret the history of this country through the lens of settler colonialism. And that brings us to 1776, which routinely is trumpeted that was a great leap forward for humanity, helping to inscribe a plethora of democratic rights. Now, if you subject the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776, to what Supreme Court justices in the majority might call textualism, what you would walk away with is an idea that the settlers led by slaveholders like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were upset with London, the colonial power, helping to stir the indigenous population, supposedly helping to unleash enraged enslaved Africans. So we see that in order to understand this revolt against British rule in 1776, we have to understand some of the prehistory. For example, one of the conflicts between the settlers and the crown, the settlers in London, was that the crown was seeking to delimit the ability of real estate speculators like George Washington to continue to wage war against the indigenous population, seize their land, push them further west, 
and then sell that land for handsome profits. Likewise, in order to understand 1776, you have to understand 1772. That is the year of Somerset's case, where fundamentally London was accused of helping to undermine slavery in England itself. And there was a fear that that particular decision would leapfrog the Atlantic, thereby jeopardizing the fortunes and enslaved Africans that had been accumulated by those like, for example, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Patrick Henry, a murderer's row of slave owners. And indeed, interestingly enough, interpretations of that period that have been transferred to the silver screen oftentimes raise that particular point. I'm thinking of the movie Bell, B-E-L-L-E, starring the Hollywood actor Google Mbatha Raw, who is of South African descent. It depicts Somerset's case in the terms that I have just described. Likewise, I would point your audience to the co-production of Canadian broadcasting, South African broadcasting, and BET, Black Entertainment Television of the United States of America, speaking of the multi-part series, Book of Negroes, which also tracks the interpretation, revising the traditional routine interpretation of 1776. And by the way, there is a scene in that particular series that is a landmark, a classic of Black cinema, where the Black heroine of this series confronts George Washington, interestingly enough, in lower Manhattan, as the so-called patriots are on the verge of triumphing and ousting the British, and she confronts him with regard to when will the Black population see the liberty and the freedom that supposedly 1776 and the revolt against British rule was said to have delivered. Those who today continue to proclaim the traditional interpretation of 1776 are talking out of both sides of their mouth. On the one hand, they argue that 1776 was this great leap forward for humanity. Then when you bring up the issue of what befell the indigenous population post-1776, or the fact that the number of enslaved Africans increased geometrically post-1776, then they resort to the argument that, well, slavery was everywhere. So if everybody was doing it, then how was 1776 this great leap for, for humanity? Now, then it's also remarkable that many of our friends on the left do not engage in comparative analysis. For example, as the social scientists might say, we have a control group with regard to Canada, which did not revolt against British rule. And yet Canada is much to the left of the United States. Toronto, the leading city uh, in this northern neighbor, uh, just elected a socialist mayor. Canada has the single-payer health care system that the United States, with this pay-or-die system, can only aspire towards. Now, at this point, uh, cue the U.S. patriots who begin attacking Canada from the left relative to the United States. Uh, Canada is somewhat progressive, which is one of the reasons why when Trump was elected in 2016, you had the notion of folks fleeing to Canada, and that may be revived again in 2024, I'm afraid to say. Also, it's interesting to put 1776 in another comparative framework. Recall that one of the major attacks against our neighbor to the south, speaking of socialist Cuba, is that it was able to survive during the Cold War because of assistance from the then Soviet Union. Today, it's being accused, although Havana denies it, of getting close to China to the point where there's a supposed uh, Chinese spy base uh, in Cuba. In other words, uh, Cuba's sovereignty is questioned because of its foreign entanglements. And yet, 
if you look at 1776, it's fair to say that these slave owners and their acolytes who defeated the mighty British Empire would not have been able to do so, but for assistance not only from France, uh, which, as you know, uh, transported soldiers from their then colony in what is now Haiti, uh, which was overrepresented in the Battle of Yorktown, which basically put paid to Britain's effort to retain what is now the United States of America, and not to mention the fact that the so-called patriots received quite significant assistance from the Netherlands. Recall that both the Netherlands and France had a bone to pick with London, and the patriots took advantage of that uh, to the point where they were able to defeat the British Empire. And then if you look shortly after the formation of the United States of America and look at round two of the battle between London and the then nation United States of America, you come to the War of 1812. It's striking to note that Tecumseh, the great Native American warrior who sought to build a so-called pan-Indian confederation to confront the settlers and prevent them from continuing to oust the Native Americans from their land and liquidate them in the process, uh, he, of course, died fighting shoulder to shoulder with the Redcoats. And let us also turn our attention to August 1814, when Black folk, enslaved Africans in Washington, D.C., the recently proclaimed capital of the so-called Republic, uh, joined with the Redcoats in torching the city, sending President James Madison and his garrulous spouse Dolly fleeing into the street one step ahead of the posse, and then fleeing on British ships to Trinidad and Tobago, where their descendants continue to reside. In many ways, this was just a replay of 1776, where once again, enslaved Africans, and the majority, to put it mildly, uh, did not engage in class collaboration and side with their so-called masters, including George Washington, in fighting the British. Uh, listeners may want to turn their attention to the proclamation by Lord Dunmore in Virginia, the last colonial governor, who offered the enslaved freedom in return for joining the Redcoats. In some ways, this anticipated Abraham Lincoln, who with his Emancipation Proclamation of January 1, 1863, was able to turn the tide against the then ascending slave owners under the umbrella of the so-called Confederate States of America. The Emancipation Proclamation was fundamentally a war-fighting measure, and it succeeded as almost 200,000 black men in particular uh, joined the Lincoln Army and helped to turn the tide against the slave owners. What happened in 1775, 1776, is that the black folk who joined Lauren Dunmore were not able to turn the tide, which led to decades more of enslavement. And speaking of Tecumseh, I think this raises the question of Native Americans, that oftentimes U.S. patriots are not able to see the tragedy involved in what befell the indigenous population when the United States was proclaimed. So, and this is something that I stress in my book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism, the Native Americans who sought to accommodate the settlers were liquidated, were ousted from their land. I'm thinking of the Cherokees, formerly of the Southeast Quadrant of North America, many of whom converted to Christianity, many of whom engaged in agriculture, of whom, of course, considered themselves to be pro-U.S., they still were ousted. Then there are the Comanches of Texas, the once denoted as the Lords of the Plains, 
who were fierce fighters, they were ousted from the land. Likewise, the Caddo, C-A-D-D-O, who had an interlocking director with black people in Texas, Louisiana, they were ousted from the land, uh, they were liquidated. It seems to me that if you have a progressive, not to mention a radical movement that tends to rationalize genocide, rationalize liquidation and ouster of the indigenous population, well, it seems to me they can rationalize or liquidate just about anything, which is perhaps one of the reasons why uh, our progressive and radical movement is in so much hot water uh, nowadays. One of the problems with the traditional interpretation of 1776 is beginning the story in the middle of the 18th century. Recall that by 1776, you had had decades, if you counted from 1565 with the incursion of the Spanish into St. Augustine, Florida, you had more than two centuries of settler colonialism in North America. If you look at the English and set aside 1619, which is routinely viewed as the onset of London's settler colonial project, but reel back to the 1580s when London first tried to establish a colony on the territory they called North Carolina, uh, once again, you had almost two centuries of settler colonial invasions of this territory and ousting of the Native Americans. It would be as if you tried to understand the onset and proclamation of black power as enunciated by Stokely Car Carmichael Kwame Ture by beginning of the story, say, in 1966, when he uttered those words, or perhaps going back and providing a, a brief uh, prehistory starting in 1950 or 1945. That's an inadequate approach to historical understanding. Uh, as I've tried to point out in some of my work, in order to understand settler colonialism, you have to understand the origins of the project. You have to understand the conflict between the predominantly Spanish Catholics and the predominantly Protestant English and how this religious conflict uh, helped to generate conflict uh, in the Americas. The Protestants were the scrappy underdogs. They were not able, unlike the Spanish, to say that their settlers should all be Protestants. That was the factor that undermined the Spanish. They had a religious qualification for settlement. London, the underdog, moved away from religious qualification to pan-Europeanism, which leads to the formation of this new identity politics known as whiteness, which morphs into white supremacy. Uh, once again, many of our friends on the left have made an error when they suggest that the formation of the United States mark a philosophical step forward in terms of the Constitution proclaimed in the late 18th century, uh, moving away, we are told at least, per the First Amendment, from the establishment of a state religion. However, I think that that's a kind of idealism. What I mean is, if you look at the facts on the ground, if you try to have a material analysis of the religious language in the First Amendment, you'll see that once again, the settlers had their hands full with regard to rambunctious Native Americans and keeping a lid on revolts of the enslaved, they needed every warm body that they could muster, and therefore there was a kind of combat pay with regard to settlers in the form of a kind of democratic rights that were not necessarily enjoyed in Europe. But having said that, and also acknowledging that religious dissidents were allowed to settle, for example, Baltimore was settled disproportionately by Catholics, under the Protestant umbrella, 
uh, many in your audience are familiar with the influx of the hounded, persecuted Jewish population into the settlements of North America. And certainly it's fair to say that once again, relatively, uh, these religious dissidents so-called enjoy more liberty and freedom than they may have enjoyed in Europe. However, the price that was paid was basically exacted at the pain of the indigenous and the Africans who these newer settlers were recruited to help to confront. And even having said that, uh, we should not assume that uh, there was little or no anti-Catholic fervor uh, in the United States. We all know about the torching of convents uh, in the U.S. Northeast in the early 19th century. Uh, We know that with regard to the U.S. conflict with North Africa in the late 18th century, early 19th century, that the U.S. leaders oftentimes scapegoated the Jewish population of North Africa for being in league with their Muslim comrades and enslaving so-called white Christians. And so, once again, we have to uh, move to a more complex analysis of the founding of this country if we're ever going to be able to mount a fight back with regard to what we are now uh, confronting. Dr. Horn, if, if I may just interject something in, and your thoughts on this in line with what you've been saying. I recently came across a number of articles that go back to July 4th, 1875, where a white mob broke up a Republican rally in Vicksburg, Mississippi, killing a black deputy sheriff. The next year, in the village of Hamburg, South Carolina, anger, anger over a black militia parade on the 4th, on the 4th, relevant to the concept of independence, boiled over into a full-blown riot that left at least seven African-American dead at the hands of white vigilantes. Now, the Hamburg massacre, which again, I just recently came across, helped conservatives wrest control of local and state governments from the biracial Republican Party that fall, making South Carolina one of the final three Southern states to be returned to the Democratic fold. So again, the concept of independence, its farcical nature when it came to the empowerment or self-determination, if you will, of the people of African ancestry. Well, what you're pointing to is what I've been trying to stress, which is that if you have this romanticized, dewy-eyed view of the formation of the United States being this great leap forward for humanity, you basically become incapable of understanding subsequent events, such as the ones you just described, and you are reduced to what a former U.S. president often said when there were massacres and racist persecution, that's not who we are. Well, at a certain point, you have to underscore that that particular approach is not only wanting intellectually, but as I've been trying to stress, it ill prepares us to develop a strategy and tactics in order to fight back against this looming reality of U.S. fascism, which seemingly is just around the corner if we're not careful. Speaking of which, I should also mention that with regard to settler colonialism, which I think is a useful lens through which to view the United States, It has at its core a concept that should be familiar to us all in helping to explicate events today. I'm speaking of class collaboration, that if you look, for example, at the first settlements in North America sponsored by London, they were sponsored by the 1%. They included English, Scots, Irish, 
of various class backgrounds, skilled workers, unskilled workers, middle class, lumpen elements, et cetera, all with a common agenda of removing and ousting the indigenous from the land and if a little bit of pluck and a lot of luck, they could probably or perhaps uh, get enslaved Africans to work for free and build a fortune. Likewise, if you look at the United States today, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to comprehend how 75 million voted for Donald J. Trump, a grifter and a con man, and perhaps a nation proto-fascist, you cannot understand those numbers without understanding class collaboration. You cannot not understand January 6, 2021, and the attempt to prevent the peaceful transfer of power at the hands and at the behest of a conglomeration of, of those defined as white across class lines, including CEOs flying in on private jets, including military veterans, including uh, shopkeepers, including declassed elements. It was a classic uh, example of the kind of class collaboration that helped to build settler colonialism in the first instance. And certainly that particular point uh, conflicts with the rather romantic view of July 4th, uh, 1776, uh, that is still dominant with regard to even the interpretations on the left. And all of that is a precursor uh, for how, perhaps for me to raise the question of the recent affirmative action decision uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court undermining the attempt to erode the racist privilege and to have more diversity, equity, and inclusion at institutions of higher education, uh, this undermining of affirmative action will probably have knock-on effects with regard to undermining affirmative action across the board, including in employment, including in the hiring of skilled workers and hiring within the building trades, et cetera. Uh, some of our friends on the left suggest that eroding the question of, quote, race, unquote, unquote, as a category through which affirmative action is implemented and substituting the category of class will do the trick and there will not be a decline in numbers. But certainly uh, that has not been the experience with the attempts to move away from race in terms of higher education at the University of California campuses and other places where race has been eroded. And in any case, affirmative action is seen as an antidote to racism, particularly anti-Black racism. Professor Horn, if I may just inject one, one comment that the Justice uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, as you continue on, on that discussion, and I should tell our listeners that you've been involved uh, in the struggle to maintain and help shape it, going back to your work with the National Conference of Black Lawyers and when affirmative action was first challenged in the Supreme Court, and that was by Alan Bakke as we stood outside the Supreme Court champing beep beep back the Bakke attack. So this isn't merely an intellectual but I want our listeners to understand there's been a practical and activist side to the work that you do. But one of the comments that I thought was so telling from Sir Justice uh, Katanji Brown Jackson that they want affirmative action, not, not, if you will, in the boardroom, but they want it in the bunker. That is to say that there is an exception which most people haven't realized in the new decision, which erodes further and almost eliminates really for any practical purposes affirmative action in the military. Or so there's a, a class and race thing that attacks the African-American populace by saying that you can have affirmative action in the bunker, but you certainly can't have it in the boardroom. 
that was a point made in the dissent by Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, and it's a fair point. And it raises very searching and profound questions because basically what the Supreme Court is saying is that you need affirmative action in order to recruit military officers to protect the empire. But you don't need affirmative action with regard to other important sectors of this society, universities not least. I find it remarkable that even today as we speak, the top leaders of the U.S. military, both uniformed and civilian, happen to be black men. Lloyd Austin, Pentagon Chief, C.Q. Brown, uh, head of the Joint Chief of Staff. And this, I'm afraid to say, uh, might uh, it, it's very ominous, it's very dangerous, because it basically reminds us of all of these failed wars, not least the war in Vietnam, where at least... At a certain point, you had a disproportionate number of black soldiers who were being killed on the battlefield at the time, at a time when we were not enjoying a full complement of rights at home. I dare say that despite this exception, military exception, that Justice Roberts spelled out in a very important footnote basically saying that West Point, the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Virginia Military Institute uh, in Lexington, the Citadel in South Carolina, these military academies can continue to pursue affirmative action at the same time when you have uh, universities are not able to do so. And I should also point listeners to the recent legislation introduced in Congress in both House and the Senate, which would tend to undermine so-called legacy preferences. That is to say, if your grandfather and great-grandfather went to some of these schools, uh, you get affirmative action points, which basically allows for white privilege to be uh, transferred generationally at the same time, when we're told that somehow the 14th Amendment uh, prevents affirmative action from being accorded to the descendants of enslaved Africans. And then I should also raise the question of what will this recent decision by this U.S. Supreme Court mean for affirmative action on the basis of gender, since many analysts have suggested that a major beneficiary of affirmative action writ large have been Euro-American women of various class backgrounds, or will it be the case that the Supreme Court says that those groups can continue to be accorded affirmative action, but those who the 14th Amendment was designed to uplift, speaking of Black people in the first instance, that they cannot benefit from affirmative action. And if I may, let me return to the point that I was making with regard to trying to substitute class uh, as a marker, uh, as opposed to, quote, race, unquote. Well, what's interesting as I was uh, articulating is that affirmative action is seen as an antidote to racism, to white supremacy. And the class question is not necessarily sufficiently elastic to deal with that. I mean, for example, if you look at the fact that black women of affluence, like Venus Williams and Beyonce, for example, uh, suffered tremendously during childbirth and almost passed uh, from this life, obviously <laughs> their class background was not a factor, nor can it, can it be said that class is the reason why black women generally endure so many problems when it comes to childbirth or with regard to a high infant mortality rates as a complement to that same phenomenon. So class just does not cut it. You have to deal with race and racism and white supremacy, uh, although, of course, there are those on the U.S. Supreme Court who would prefer that we not do so. Let me conclude by just making a, a few uh, other points, uh, which is that of late, uh, you've had some very dangerous propaganda 
from Senator Rick Scott of Florida, who was thinking of throwing his hat into the ring and running for president, not to mention his fellow Floridian, the 45th U.S. president, Mr. Trump, who've talked about uh, ousting altogether from these shores uh, those who are denoted as socialists and communists. Uh, We should take this rhetoric uh, very seriously, uh, particularly since we're not able to dismiss out of hand the possibility that there will be a return to the White House of Agent Orange himself by January 2025. And I don't think that we can begin to mount an adequate strategy and tactics to beat back this neo-fascist attack unless we have a firm understanding of how we got to this point in the first instance, which brings us back to how the country was founded, which brings us back to the downplaying of genocide, which allows one to rationalize just about anything, which brings us back to class collaboration. And I think that it's important to point out as well that in terms of making an analysis of uh, history over the past centuries, as I was beginning to outline uh, just a few moments ago, you really have to understand this transition from religion as a major marker of society, beginning with settler colonialism and how that fades with the rise of the race project and with the triumph of the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, you have a staggering blow delivered to the race project, and you begin to see the glimmerings of a class project, uh, which reminds us that we make a fatal error if we do not see the question of slavery and the question of the struggle of descendants of the enslaved as fundamentally, among other things, a class question, because there was no class of workers exploited more severely than workers who were not paid altogether. And that helped to generate a very fierce fight back on their part, which then helped to shape the nation in which their descendants continue to embody. Professor... Horn, I wonder if you think we are at even a more serious juncture now that not only flies in the face of the issue of independence for the people of African ancestry, but takes us much closer to all-out war against that population. And I am thinking specifically going from uh, Trayvon Martin to Ahmad Arbery, to the issue of uh, really it's okay in America to shoot black people for ringing doorbells like Ralph Yari in Kansas City, or now like A.J. Owens in Ocala, Florida, or for that matter, the vigilante choking to death in New York of Jordan Neely on the uh, subway train and for the state, for the state to then implement the most minimal, uh, de minimis kinds of uh, potential penalties and charges. Is it really open season and um, acknowledged as such or even promoted or allowed or given license to, if you will, by the stand your ground laws and by the state in the charges against these vigilante murders of African-Americans. Well, once again, we have to return to history and in order to get a firm grasp of what your question suggests. That is to say, as my preceding remarks have tended to indicate one of the problems that Black people have faced under the settler colonial regime is that our extreme exploitation forced us to fight back with every fiber in our body that oftentimes involved alliances with the real or imagined antagonists of the settlers, Native Americans in the first instance. But the problem is 
that when you fight a war and, and continually lose, which was the state of affairs from 1776 uh, going forward through the centuries, you can expect to be pulverized and penalized forever unless and until you're able to turn the tables. We were able to do so to an extent with the Haitian Revolution. We were able to do so to an extent in the mid-20th century with the rise of African liberation movements and Caribbean liberation movements and the United States having to carry favor with these emerging regimes and the ideological contestation with the then socialist camp. Uh, But with the collapse of the socialist camp, you see unleashed further a reign of terror against the black population in particular, uh, represented in spiraling, skyrocketing rates of incarceration, uh, represented by the numerous instances of police terror, some of which you have just uh, enumerated. And it fundamentally amounts to what could fairly be called a slow motion genocide. Uh, I would only say that the way we have been able to be but and rebuke that kind of slow motion genocide previously is through international alliances. But alas, uh, that does not seem to be high on the agenda of many of our friends in the progressive movement, in the radical movement, and even in the black liberation movement to a certain degree. And there is... um... One of the other things that I was, uh, wanted to ask you about, is there also a new level of uh, surveillance and fight back uh, by the state? And I'm talking about the Democratic Party, i.e. the Biden administration, in response to the organization of African Americans as, for example, the prosecution and uh, the indictment of members of the African People's Socialist Party and their support entity, uh, the Yuhuru uh, Solidarity Movement. Your your thoughts on that as well, that this really is a a period in which uh, it is not merely a a vigilante uh, movement, but that, again, the state and the state in the form of the Democrats are actually preventing the advancement and the move on the path further to freedom, to that North Star, if you will, uh, by the uh, Democratic Party, the Biden administration. Well, one takeaway from my remarks over the past minutes is that an undergirding factor that helped to construct these United States of America has been anti-blackness. And what that should tell us is that irrespective of who is holding the reins of power, uh, be they Republicans or Democrats, or perhaps uh, even a party that is perceived as more friendly to our interests, we're going to have to light a fire uh, under that administration. We're going to have to uh, basically execute a fair amount of street heat, as the saying goes, And that brings us to the African People's Socialist Party, uh, which is now uh, under heavy persecution uh, by the U.S. authorities, supposedly because of their ties to foreign powers, uh, Russia not least. And this reminds us of the bad old days of the 1950s when black people who were struggling against Jim Crow were too often accused of being manipulated by so-called outside agitators, or if you look at the case of the late, great Paul Robeson, uh, the enormously talented actor and actor and activist, uh, he was basically accused of being in the pocket of Moscow, which led to his persecution, which led to a steep, a, a steep precipitous drop in his income from the six figures to the low four figures as passport taken, et cetera. And if we have learned anything from what befell Paul Robeson, it should be that we cannot allow that kind of history to be repeated. Uh, We must stand in solidarity uh, with the African People's Socialist Party. 
We must demand that the charges be dropped against them and their comrades because this is just a shot over the bow at the rest of us. I think that once again, reverting to history, we recognize that in the bad old days, the plantation owners felt that you only had to beat one enslaved African to keep the entire plantation in line. And so the idea is to turn the persecution of the African People's Socialist Party into a kind of uh, some, some sort of a demonstration project, which will then intimidate the rest of us and keep us in line and prevent us from making the kinds of international alliances that are so desperately needed if we are to beat back this proto-fascism. And once again, to reiterate, the lesson of history is that historically, progressive movements, in particular the progressive black movement, has needed international alliances in order to prevail. Well, Professor Horn, I can't thank you enough for lifting up the today relevance of Frederick Douglass's 1852 speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, and placing it in the context of the experiences then and the issue of settler colonialism, which we have yet, and that is most decidedly within the uh, quote unquote left movement, not reckoned with. Uh, Is there a final punctuating sentence that you would like to uh, provide for us on this July independence weekend holiday 2023? Well, part of the good news, and I know that what I've been talking about in the last few minutes may be perceived as dispiriting to some, but part of the good news is that there's been enormous progress in terms of our historical understanding of what's transpired transpired on these shores. I'm thinking of progress with regard to Native American studies in particular. Once again, even though many of our friends on the left continue to sweep that important question under the rug, that is not necessarily the case for a growing a cadre of scholars who are reinvigorating this field and are helping to transform our understanding of uh, how we got to the point where we are today. And I would say the same is true to a certain extent for the field of Black studies. It's no accident that Governor DeSantis of Florida has black studies in the crosshairs. It's no accident that Governor Youngkin of Virginia basically triumphed in the gubernatorial race by demagogically uh, pointing the finger of accusation at what he called critical race uh, theory, uh, CRT, uh, which supposedly is helping to throw dust in the eyes of the U.S. public. It's no accident that uh, President Trump in his last months of his regime appointed a so-called 1776 commission to try to hopefully in his mind uh, mislead folks about how this country was formed. And so we recognize, and we should recognize, particularly on a July 4th so-called holiday, that history is more than just trying to understand the past, although it is certainly that. Uh, History is is also a weapon that helps us to understand the present and to shape a glorious future. Dr. Gerald Horn, African-American historian, professor, political activist, brilliant and uncompromising as ever, well, grateful for your work.